Well, hello, this is John Rutter here. The organisers of the Charleswood Festival this year have been kind enough to invite me to take about 10 minutes of your time to make my confessions, confessions of a composer. And what I thought I'd do is line up, rather like Desert Island Discs, eight of my favourite questions that I'm most often asked. Um, they don't get any easier to answer, but if quite a lot of people ask me about them, then there must be some reason they want to know. And the first one is, well, did you always know you wanted to be a composer? It's often said that you don't choose composition as a way of life, it chooses you. And I think it's true that from when I was maybe four or five years old, I loved to sit by myself for hours at the family piano. I was an only child at that point. My sister didn't come along till I was 10. And I spent quite a lot of time on my own, but I was never lonely because I discovered once I'd lifted that piano lid that I got the key to a wonderful, magical world. I couldn't really play the piano, but I think somebody must have spotted that I had some sort of a musical gift and I started to have piano lessons. Well, if you've had piano lessons, you'll know that you're expected to play lots of scales and arpeggios and to play pieces with silly names like fairies at the bottom of the garden. And I remember one I particularly detested called the pear tree is laden with fruit. No idea why it's called that. And I found out quite quickly that rather than play the scales and arpeggios and other composers' offerings, what I preferred to do was make up my own little improvisations. I gave them fancy titles which were just about as bad, I think. There was one I wrote called Daybreak. It must have been about six years old at the time. And I didn't know that Maurice Ravel had done it somewhat better in his ballet Daphnis and Chloe. But I don't think that would have put me off because I carried on making things up at the piano, doodling away. And you know, in a way that's still what I'm doing today, except I get paid for it. I had lessons at school and encouragement all the way along, which really leads me to the second favorite question, which is who were the greatest influences on me? I was very fortunate to be sent to a boys' school in North London, Highgate School, where there was a very strong musical tradition. And now here's a link with your festival. My teacher was a wonderful man called Edward Chapman, who had been a pupil at Cambridge University of Charles Wood, no less. And he sometimes talked about Dr. Wood, how he was quite a disciplinarian. Um, he, Dr. Wood, loved choral music and was a fine organist and I think all of this was passed on to me so I'm rather proud of the fact that I'm actually Charles Wood's grandson in music. I never met him of course he died in 1926 but I did walk past his house, charming residence opposite one of the cathedrals and I thought my goodness this was where it all began and who could have foreseen that Charles Wood would make his way to Cambridge and become professor of music, a post he actually held for only two years because he succeeded his fellow Irishman, Stanford, who died in 1924. But unfortunately, Charles Wood himself died only two years later. But if you've ever sung Ding Dong Merrily on High at Christmas, that's one of the carols he collected and harmonised so beautifully. And if you've been connected with the world of cathedral music, you'll certainly know his wonderful anthem, Hail Gladdening Light. So I'm rather fortunate that at one remove, I inherited some of the tradition of Charles Wood, a conservative craftsman, but my goodness me, he knew how to write. And Edward Chapman taught me how to write music. And I like to think that 
in his words, I heard some of the teachings and maxims of Dr. Wood being passed on to me. The next question is one that often comes up. Generally, young composers ask me this one. They say, what was your first big break? Well, did I know I wanted to be a composer while I was at school? Perhaps. I didn't know that you could make a living from it. And I went on to Cambridge University to study music. But at that point, I didn't really know um, whether I would be earning my living writing music. I don't think I knew you probably could. Um, but then this was the big break. I met Sir David Wilcox, the legendary director of King's College Choir. He took a weekly class in, gosh, this sounds so academic, harmony and counterpoint. And I remember at the end of one of our weekly classes, he took me aside and he said, John, well, no, he didn't say John, he said, Mr. Rutter. It was all very formal back in those days. And you wore your gown for lectures and classes. And he said, I understand you've been composing. And I said, oh, well, yes, that's true. Uh, he said, would you bring some of your compositions to my rooms next Monday, nine o'clock? Well, that was an order, not a suggestion. Um, he had been, of course, um, a captain and was awarded the Military Cross in World War II. So when Sir David Wilcox gave you an order, you obeyed. And I duly turned up the next Monday with a little pile of my pieces to his rather grand rooms in King's College. Heart beating a bit faster, my mouth somewhat dry, and I showed him a pile of my rather short juvenile pieces, among which was one called the Shepherd's Pipe Carol. And I think there was another one of mine there called the Nativity Carol. That was probably one of my very earliest efforts. I think I must have been 16 when I wrote that one. And I pulled it out of a bottom drawer and there it was. Well, um, imagine Sir David um, leafing through this pile of manuscripts without saying a word. And I didn't know what he was thinking until he looked up at the end and smiled and said, would you be interested in these being published? Gosh, would I be interested? Well, um, that was the start of quite a long journey into composition because in those days there was a very big gap between being an aspiring composer and being a published composer. Doesn't matter so much these days because composers have got so many more ways of reaching their potential audiences through websites, through inputting their music into one of these wonderful computer programs, sound bites, all of that sort of thing, which was not available in those days. So you had to have a publisher or you really weren't over the first hurdle. And it was thanks to Sir David that I began an association with the publisher that I've been with ever since, Oxford University Press. And people sometimes say, well, how come when you were at Cambridge that you're published by Oxford University Press? And there's a simple reason for that, which is that Cambridge University Press doesn't publish music. Oxford University Press does. And it's been a long and happy association over many years. I didn't know where it was going to lead, but I think somewhere in my attic, I've got the letter that was written to me by the head of music there, Christopher Morris, who said, Mr. Rutter, we are very interested in these pieces. Would you like them to be published? And would you like an annual retainer, which will give us first refusal on your future work, 50 pounds a year. Well, even then it wasn't princely, but I was quite impressed. So that was probably the first big break. And once you're published, your work is literally made public. People can get to perform it, they can get to hear it, not just within Britain, but internationally, because OUP, Oxford University Press, does straddle the entire globe, really. And little by little, commissions started to come in. Now, that leads me on to the next question I'm often asked, which is, 
how come that so much of your music is for choir? So much choral music. Well, um, I didn't plan it that way. Really, I didn't. But when I began to compose, it sprang out of my being a member of my school choir and my local parish church choir as well. It seemed only a very short step from singing choral music to writing it. And to this day, I must say that when I write for choir, I feel that in some sense, I'm coming home. I love to write for instruments and I'm a great fan of orchestras. It's a little bit like pressing your nose to the window of someone else's party. Um, I always feel I'm an invited guest in the world of orchestras, but with choirs, they're like family. Perhaps you know that feeling. And of course, I love words. And the great thing about choral music is that it has words. And that's one of those things that I enjoy, especially not actually composing, but searching for words that I might set to music. I've got quite a library upstairs and in my home here in, in England, uh, near Cambridge. And of course, we've got a wonderful university library there. I can browse for hours and I've got my own volumes of poetry. I love to look for texts in the Bible and in old prayer books. And uh, really it's a limitless resource. Um, that's the great thing that choral music has. Apart from, of course, it's been a wonderful area to be associated in because quite simply it's got so much better in my lifetime. Uh, the standard of choirs has just skyrocketed thanks to some of the great leaders in the choral world, like Sir David Wilcox, who I've mentioned, and there have been many others. So it's been a great growth area. Let's pass over the present inconvenience, the rude interruption caused by this awful virus, and let's look back over what has been a glorious few decades of music for choirs everywhere, and of course actually for church music and cathedral music because the standard of that has undergone a remarkable improvement. May I say how impressed I've been with the occasions when I've heard the special choir that you assemble every year for your lovely festival. We come now to the hardest question of all for every composer. Where do you get your ideas from? well, from other composers, and there's a confession. We all stand on one another's shoulders. Um, there's no composer in history that hasn't gained ideas, borrowed ideas, stolen ideas, taken ideas from his or her predecessors. Uh, my goodness me, we've got a thousand years of written down choral music, which is longer than any other tradition of music, orchestral music, dates back maybe 300 years at the most. But if you go right back to the wonderful Gregorian chants of the Middle Ages, there's inspiration for a start. So I suppose perhaps a more serious answer to where I get my ideas from is Saint Cecilia. Um, and she really stands as a symbol of inspiration that is offered to all musicians. Um, she actually wasn't really terribly connected with music. The idea that um, she carried a portable organ with her, you may have seen some of those lovely medieval paintings, that's a bit of an invention caused by a mistranslation of the text. But she has become the patron saint of music, and I like to think that she flits around the globe, um, just popping a little idea or two into our ears. And, um, well, um, you know, she's got lots of composers to visit, but I always hope for a visit from her. That brings us on to working methods. And people often ask this, do you have a set routine or do you just wait till inspiration comes and you feel like composing? Well, you know, um, to be honest, if you waited till you feel like it, you'd wait forever. 
And so I think any professional writer, not just composers, but probably novelists, painters, journalists, and all of those would tell you that it really helps to have a disciplined framework. And I sit down um, at my desk or at the piano, if possible, at about the same time after I've dealt with the morning's crop of emails. And I stay there until I can't bear it any longer. And I come home in the evenings um, from my little composing cottage, which is supposed to be a secret, but I'll tell you about it. Um, it's set in the middle of farmland next to a beautiful medieval church in the countryside, not far from Cambridge. And that's where I go. I keep it very simple. Uh, there is a telephone, but no one knows the number. Uh, no internet connection and no television. I do have a radio for when I boil up my bowl of soup at lunchtime, but I sit there all by myself. And if you're going to be miserable trying to think up ideas out of nowhere with a deadline looming, and that of course is where a lot of us get our ideas from, then uh, you may as well be miserable somewhere nice. And I look out over beautiful farmland across a valley and I like to think that maybe it nourishes what I do a little bit. Don't believe the romantic myths, though, about Beethoven walking in the Vienna woods and suddenly there was the pastoral symphony because, you know, the secret is it's all hard work. What advice would I give a young composer? That's a question that comes up a lot. And indeed, what's the best advice I've ever been given? Well, the advice I give any young composer is work at it. Be the best composer you can. Take every opportunity to learn. Take every opportunity to have your work performed, even if it's just by friends. And you have to develop a rather steely core of self-belief. It's no good being easily discouraged. If you get too discouraged, then you would never write anything. So expect negative reviews, expect setbacks, expect disappointments, expect sometimes bad performances. And that can be an awful feeling when it's a new piece. But if you can withstand that and push on and not be disheartened, then you're halfway to being a composer. You will discover your gift if you have one, and others will discover it. What you can do something about, and you can't do much about your gift because you either have it or you don't. We're all creative in one way or another, but of course not everybody's got the particular creative gift to write music. But if you have something to say in music, then that will be recognized, not necessarily by many people, but I do believe that, gosh, talent, and let's even use that word genius, does attract recognition in some way. And that brings me on to the best advice I was ever given, which was from Edward Chapman, who I'm coming back to, the wonderful director of music at school who did so much to encourage me and generations of other young fellows to get involved in music. And what he said to me was, write the music that's in your heart. Write the music that's in your heart. Don't worry about what other people are writing. Don't worry if it seems to be out of fashion or the wrong style for what's going around. Just write the music that's in your heart. Be true to yourself is the um, rather classier way of putting that. But um, cliche though it is, I do think it's true. So here I am um, in the autumn of my years. I'm aiming for 150, but I don't know if I'll get there. And looking back, um, which of your works, I'm often asked, are you most proud of? Always the next one, the one I haven't written yet. And I don't really like looking in the mirror. You know, somehow looking at one's own work doesn't get you anywhere. 
do the best job you can with it um, while you're writing it. And I think every professional composer does that. But when it's done, it's done. People sometimes say, do you revise earlier works? Do you go back over them? Not really. Um, and, uh, you know, there are some works I know I'm not proud of and I probably shouldn't have written them. But then I wouldn't be telling you what those are, now would I? Thank you for joining me.